Welcome everyone to the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos, whoever you are, wherever you are in your life's journey, whatever you believe, whoever you love, you are welcome here. This is our Biblical Scholarship and Literacy class, uh, Series, Lecture 24. Today we're talking about Leviticus 14 and 16, uh, the Day of Atonement. I want to remind everyone, if you're um, looking for some of this material, that we have a class webpage. Uh, in that webpage we have a syllabus and a schedule. Uh, the syllabus will have links to things like the handouts. I actually have handouts today. I'm, I'm on the ball. Those are on the table here if anyone wants a copy. And then if you're watching online, uh, there'll be a link to the handout both in the video description and also in the um, in this class syllabus. Uh, the web page is sites.google.com view biblical scholarship and literacy. Again, I apologize for the long URL. Uh, we also, of course, have a calendar and it's actually updated and, and right. It'll tell you when our classes are, uh, so you know. Uh, and so last time we, we started the book of Leviticus. The so last class was, was the introduction to Leviticus. We compared it to, uh, to the Vedas in Hinduism in the sense that it's a, a set of instructions for priestly rituals, uh, for uh, the sort of rituals they perform every day, that sort of stuff, uh, how they, how they um, cleanse impurity, uh, how they offer sacrifice, etc. Um, the book of Leviticus has uh, two main sections. Uh, the first section is chapters 1 through 16, which was written by P. So if you recall some of our stuff on biblical authorship, P is one of the main authors of the first five books of Moses. Uh, H is an author that, that we believe shows up. It's related to P, uh, but it seems to be distinct. So H is the name we have for what we call the Holiness Code, which is the second half of the book of Leviticus, which seems to have a distinct set of authorship and, and origin. And then chapter 27 is this addendum. So again, in our first class, we did 1 through 15, uh, leaving 16 for today. And then uh, next month, we'll be able to cover the Holiness Code. Uh, the section 1 through 16 has these three parts. 1 through 7 has instructions for sacrifice. 8 through 10 has this uh, description of the dedication of the tabernacle and the priests, uh, followed by the transgression of Aaron's sons, who, who break some rules and get burned. Uh, then we have uh, chapters 11 through 16, which have descriptions of both ritual purity and also how to cleanse uh, ritual purity, to, to get rid of ritual impurity, uh, which, of course, culminates in chapter 16, which is the Day of Atonement. When we talked about that story of, of Aaron's sons, and their, their sin, we described it as a, one of many false stories. A false story has to do with um, disobedience in the presence of God's holy places uh, that leads to expulsion. So we have the, the fall of Adam and Eve, or, or expulsion or death. We have the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, e tells a story, with a little bit of help from Jay, about a golden calf that they worship, which then leads to their, um, their uh, some of the Israelites' death. In E, it is uh, Aaron's fault. Uh, for P, P is a, a descendant of Aaron and an Aaronite priest, and so for him, no, it's two of Aaron's sons, and so he tells this story of offering strange fire and the two sons of Aaron being killed, and then a righteous son takes over and, and continues the righteous line. So you can see that the, uh, the difference in, in uh, kind of political positioning between uh, E and P. Uh, then, of course, then we have the, the second half, which has this reference to clean and unclean animals, uh, things you eat, uh, menstrual flows, all that sort of stuff that, that renders someone unclean, and it has the solution for that, which has to do with usually washing your clothes and being unclean until the evening, that sort of thing. It also has stuff about cleansing the leper, etc. Chapter 14, which actually we, we're going to go over again today because it's related to the Day of Atonement stuff. So here's, that's our plan. We did Leviticus 1 through 15, peace instructions for the priests last month. This month, the Day of Atonement, with a little uh, shout back to Leviticus 14, the cleansing of the leper. And then next month, we'll have Leviticus 17 through 27, the Holiness Code. That's our H author. And then we'll be done with Leviticus and we'll move on to uh, next year to numbers. So Day of Atonement, what is this thing? Uh, it's probably, it's, it's considered the most holy of Israelites, Israel's festivals. Even Jews today will, will celebrate the Day of Atonement as uh, what they call Yom Kippur, which is the Hebrew term for that, which is uh, the most holy uh, day of the Jewish calendar. It's part of a festival, uh, but it's also part of what we would call a festival complex. And I don't mean it's com the festivals are com complicated. Um, it, the term comes from the idea of a, a temple complex. We have many temples that all kind of relate to each other. 
Well, this is a festival complex, many festivals that relate to each other. Starting with Rosh Hashanah, which is the first two days of this long festival week, Yom Kippur is on then day nine, and then Sukkot is on day 13 through 21. So these rituals, Rosh Hashanah is the New Year's festival where they blow the shofar and they decree the, the, the uh, announcement for the next year and the, and, and the fates for that year. But then they realize, well, the problem is we haven't been good enough last year. So you have this week of repentance followed by a cleansing ritual, which is the Day of Atonement, which we're covering today. And then after that, you have a celebration where they go out and they live in booths, uh, Sukkot. And the idea of the booths is um, the idea of the booths is uh, described in the text as a reference to the Exodus, where they lived uh, in, in tents. Uh, however, originally it was probably an agricultural festival, and it had to do with going out in tents and, and harvesting the fields. And it's a very joyous celebration. After the Day of Atonement, your sins are forgiven, then you go out and you celebrate. And, and it, it's uh, one way to, to help uh, people understand it is you can think of it sort of like Thanksgiving because this is a harvest festival where you give thanks to the, the, the bounteous crop you've been given. Uh, those that fest the festivals of Israel and the festival complex are the subject of this, this handout, which is here on the screen, and it's up there, and it'll be in the, the link if you want it. And it just has a reference to the various uh, festivals of Israel and uh, the references in the text where you can find references to them, and then a kind of a calendar that shows you when they take place. Um, and it tells you when the modern date is roughly. Uh, the Jews have a, a, a lunar calendar, and so they, their dates don't line up exactly with any, uh, with any kind of, of our modern dates. But it tells you roughly when the festival would, would fall. So that's the subject of the handout. So the Day of Atonement. Um, the Day of Atonement has a, a long list of things that happen. Uh, and we'll go through all of them in order. But this is, this is, um, this is the um, kind of list of everything that, that happens on this day. So the ritual has many parts. It's complicated. But we'll break this up into pieces. Recall that this takes place at the Israelite temple. We had another lecture on Israelite temples a while back. Uh, and, but recall that the temple has three main parts. A courtyard, what's known as the holy place. This is the courtyard the holy place, and at the very back, the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant, which will become important. Out here is the altar of sacrifice and the laver of water for washing. Uh, later temples will add um, two pillars in front and a series of side rooms around the back that are kind of, we believe, storage rooms um, along the back. But uh, they all still have these three main divisions, the, the, the courtyard, the holy place, and the Holy of Holies. This matters because the Day of Atonement is the only day when someone is allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. Now, we believe the original of the Day of Atonement ritual was probably just something that was done whenever people uh, felt like they needed to, to cleanse the temple of something impure. So it probably happened whenever it was needed, kind of a, on an emergency basis. The, whenever the high priest thought the temple needed to be cleaned, he could do this. Maybe when there was a plague or something, they could do this to try to appease the plague, that sort of thing. So it was probably an emergency ritual that could happen any time. But as it became associated with the New Year's festival, which we'll see in the Babylonian version, which we'll talk about later, it probably is uh, in, in the nations around them as well. As it became associated with the New Year's festival, it became a, a once a year sort of thing, where they had to do it once a year. That meant that the Holy of Holies was only entered once every year by the high priest on this special day. So what did the day consist of? Well, first, the high priest washes at the laver and dresses up in what we call the Day of Atonement clothing. The Day of Atonement clothing does not look like the normal high priest clothes. We, we've, uh, when, I, when we taught about the temple, I brought my uh, copy of the high priest clothes that I had made in to show everyone. Uh, and it has lots of parts, some light white clothes over a blue robe. And then it has this ephod, which is like an apron, and the breastplate, and then these shoulder pieces and then this special uh, headpiece with a crown on it that says holiness to the Lord. This is the normal high priest clothing, but on the Day of Atonement, he dresses in a white robe with a white undergarments, white headpiece, and a white sash. And so everything he, he, he wears is pure white the first day. So the first part, sorry. He'll put on the other clothes in a minute. So following along, he goes in, he washes at the laver, and he probably goes in the holy place where he's got some privacy, addresses in, um, the white clothes. 
He offers a sacrifice of a bull for his own sins. So this is important, and this is something the author of Hebrews will pick up on later. But the high priest, before he can cleanse, now the, huh, I should have started with, the purpose of the, of the ritual is to cleanse the temple of the impurities that have gathered, especially into the Holy of Holies, that is only entered once a year, throughout the people's sins that year. So, you, so they've accumulated these sins for the year. That's important because if, if the sins build up, God won't dwell with them. And so to keep God with them, they have to cleanse the temple and they have to cleanse the temple. So this is a, a big uh, cleansing ritual to cleanse the temple of all of its ritual impurities. But it starts with the priest cleansing himself of his own ritual impurities. And so that's in chapter, uh, chapter 16, verse 6 and 11. And then in, in verses 12 through 13, he enters the Holy of Holies with the bull's blood, with incense, and some coals. So once he gets in, he burns the incense, sprinkles the, blood, the bull's blood upon uh, the altar before the mercy seat. The mercy seat is another name for the lid that sits on the Ark of the Covenant. It's this big golden lid um, that has the two cherubim uh, on top of it. And it's called the mercy seat because the ark itself forms God's throne. And this is the throne on which God sits and you come to be judged. And so it's the mercy seat because you hope that God is going to be merciful when he judges you. So the priest uh, brings some blood and uh, burns incense um, right before the mercy seat with this portable censer. Now remember there's this altar of incense just outside. Um, this text describes a shovel of some sort. Egyptian versions of this have a picture of a, a spoon, right, like this, uh, with a little blow tube even in the end that you can put incense on. Uh, we don't know if this shovel is the same thing or if it's actually uh, uh, something more like this picture. But in the Egyptian version, there's usually a, a hand cupped in the bottom to, and then a bowl. So the, hand is, the, the, the spoon has a, has a handle and then a hand carved on the edge with a bowl in it that you put the incense in. Um, then he goes out and he casts lots. So he brings two goats and he casts a lot, meaning he probably reaches into a box and pulls out uh, 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 some sort of a metal plate of some sort. And he casts lots for one that says to Yahweh, for the Lord. The other says O Azazel or to Azazel. And we'll talk about what that might mean in a minute. And then he puts the one on his right hand. He takes one goat on his right hand and that's the goat that is to Yahweh. The one in his left hand is to Azazel. It's probably where we get some of the idioms like be found on the right hand of God. Later in the in book of Revelations and Judgments, they talk about God sorting people to their right hand and to their left. Um, this is probably again a reference to this ritual. And so they have these two plates. They tie the plates onto the, onto the forehead of these goats. So one, just like the high priest has holiness to the Lord, one has to the Lord, the other has to Azazel, or meaning, probably meaning a sacrifice to the Lord. But then to Azazel, if it's kind of going to be parallel construction, would be a being, some sort of, a, of, a, of an actual entity that this other goat is given to. So one goat is given to, to Yahweh, the other goat is given to Azazel, some sort of a being. So who is this Azazel? Most modern scholars uh, think, and, and Jewish have done this, Jewish interpreters have done this several ways. Um, you, Probably through a mistranslation of uh, Azazel, they, they've translated it as the goat that goes away. Or we call it, uh, that's where we get the English term, the scapegoat. So if you ever have somebody who, who is blamed for something they didn't do, they're a scapegoat. That's where we get that term, the goat that escapes, the goat that goes away. That's probably a mistranslation. It's probably, again, to a being, Azazel. Um, but a lot of Jewish scholars have agreed that this is some sort of a... Of a, of a, of a desert demon. Now again, the, the idea that they're referencing a desert demon in the ritual doesn't mean that the people doing the ritual believed in the demon. Early rituals might have, later rituals might not have, but just the, the presence of it in the ritual does not mean that they believed in said demon. At least by the later age, we know they didn't. Uh, at least we think they didn't. Um, but uh, we, you can use something as an analogy without believing in its literal uh, application. However, it's entirely possible and probable that the earliest versions of this actually believed in two beings, one Jehovah, Yahweh, and the other Azazel, and they had to appease both of them in order to cleanse the temple. So, uh, But it, since the goat is sent out into the wilderness, this is probably some sort of a wilderness demon that you want to appease his anger, 
and right, and you want to gain Yahweh's friendship and appease the wilderness demon's anger. Um, so then the next piece of the ritual, after after the two goats are are lots are drawn for the two goats. Um, the the priest sacrifices the goat to Yahweh and sprinkles its blood as he did on, with the ram's blood in the Holy of Holies. Uh, he also sprinkles the blood on the Lord, of the Lord's goat in the holy place, and he sprinkles its blood at the altar of sacrifice. It's almost as if this, this blood forms a sort of detergent that washes the, the tabernacle clean of, of its impurity. Then he lays his hands on the scapegoat and uh, confesses the people's sins and shortcomings and thereby transfers their sins and their actions onto the head of the goat. The goat is then sent away out into the wilderness, and then according to later traditions, it's actually um, thrown off for a cliff uh, and killed, but the text itself makes no mention of killing the goat. It's actually released into the wilderness. Um, one can imagine that one of these goats wandered back into camp, carrying all of Israel's uh, impurities with it, and someone, someone decided we should probably just kill this thing when we send it out into the wilderness. But again, originally, it was just released into the wilderness, where it would then carry the sins of Israel out into the wilderness. Um, the man who takes the scapegoat to the wilderness then washes his clothes and is unclean till evening. Um, then the priest goes into the holy place, removes his day of atonement clothes, and puts on his normal high priest clothes. This is with the blue robe and the breastplate and the ephod. Then he goes out and he offers a ram as a burnt offering to, for himself, again, because he may have picked up some impurities during the ritual. As he cleaned the temple of its impurities, he may have picked up some, so he offers another ram for his own impurities, and then he offers a, a, a sacrifice for the people's impurities. So the ritual cleanses the temple, the priest, and the people uh, so that they can all be forgiven both of their sins and kind of their ritual impurity, which may not be related to sin. It might just be, you know, impurity happens. You've got to clean it up. Um, but it can also accumulate through immoral actions, and so this is how they cleanse themselves of all of those things. And then a man takes the remnants of the ram and the Lord's goat outside the camp and burns the remains and then washes himself and is unclean until the evening. What did any of this mean to, to the people who did it? Well, I'm going to try to get at some of that by making some comparisons. I'm going to start with comparing it to other Israelite stories in the Bible and, and outside of the Bible. Um, then I'm going to compare it to other ancient religious traditions, some stuff from Babylon, Egypt, and, and the Hittites. Uh, and then I'll talk about how Christians have interpreted the story years later, how they saw meaning in the text. So let's start with some Israelite stories. And the first, of course, is the Garden of Eden. Uh, that's our primary story here. And uh, what, what the, the, this is kind of the, the meaning of the entire temple is the temple is designed to be a miniature Garden of Eden so that when you enter the temple's Holy of Holies, you are reversing the fall and going back as you came. We've said this before when we described the temple. But if the, if the Day of Atonement is the only day you get to go into the Holy of Holies, then this is the day when the fall itself is reversed and your sins are therefore cleansed. So the, the story of the Garden of Eden is related to the Day of Atonement. Again, now you can, you can obviously ask question to me is which came first right did the story of did the myth of the garden precede the ritual or did the ritual precede the myth and then the myth was told in terms of the ritual that already existed um, I tend to lean towards the latter but they probably uh, co-developed together or the, the rituals were modified based on the myths and the myths were modified based on the rituals but I would say the ritual comes first because we have examples of this same ritual from other uh, non-israelite religions nearby that predate Israelite religion. And so I think Jay's story of the creation was probably told in relation to this ritual that already existed. Um, I should also point out that, that uh, P, the author of this, this particular text, you know, the instructions to the priests, that's the priestly source, P, he's generally considered to have been a late author, probably writing after the, the Babylonian exile. But the ritual here is almost certainly much, much older. And so P is describing an existing early ritual that he and his fellow priests perform. So the ritual is probably ancient. The source telling us about the ritual is probably late. Um, but then we get, we get all sorts of other interesting stories, like Cain and Abel. Remember this story, right? Cain uh, works the field. Abel has, keeps the sheep. Abel offers a sacrifice of a sheep, and God approves of his sacrifice, but not of Cain's. It's already connected to sacrifice. You notice the ritual of the Day of Atonement starts with sacrifice. But then uh, they fight, 
and Cain kills Abel. And so one of them dies, the one that was offering sacrifice to, to Yahweh, the, the child that represents Yahweh, dies. And the other child, Cain, is cast out into the wilderness and exiled because of his sin for killing his brother. Do you see, do you see the, the parallels are, are uh, I think, obvious? Um, but we also get this, this, strange, uh, this strange parallel in Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, Isaac and Ishmael are uh, children of Abraham, and if you remember the story, Abraham has one child, Isaac, who will become his heir and represent him, who is later going to be sacrificed or offered as sacrifice. Ishmael is kicked out into the wilderness. So you have these two sons, one sacrificed, the other kicked out into the wilderness. Um, we also have a, a, a different version of the comparison in Isaac and the ram. Right? Isaac is going to be sacrificed, but the ram then dies in Isaac's place. So this one kind of has a substitution motif going on, but you can see a parallel to the Day of Atonement. One sacrificed, only in this case, one sacrificed, one released. Whereas in the other two, it was one sacrificed, one expelled. When I started this, I was trying to, when I was much younger <laughs> and just starting out, I was trying to find the answer. Like, what, what did, did this mean? I, almost as if the whole thing had been written by one person and they had one thing in mind and I was gonna find the meaning of the text. And I no longer believe that's even uh, possible. The text is written by lots of different people. And so sometimes one is sacrificed, one is released. Sometimes one is sacrificed, one is expelled. Um, Joseph and the goat, we have the same sort of thing, right? Joseph is going to be killed by his brothers, but instead his brothers find a goat and kill the goat in his place. And then they put the blood of the goat on the clothes and the, 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 the uh, coat of many colors, and they bring it to his father and say, see, Joseph is dead. And then Joseph is expelled into Egypt, uh, but also saved by the, by the substitute of the goat. Um, then we get this great story from First Enoch, which is a, clearly a reference to, uh, to this ritual. And First Enoch 10, verse 4 through 5, relates that the angel Raphael is commanded to bind the rebellious demon Azel, hand and foot, and banish him to the wilderness called Dudel, and cover him with sharp rocks, reminiscent of the cliff from which the goat was thrown, according to later tradition. And the reference to Azazel is obvious. This is from Joseph Milgram in his commentary. So uh, First Enoch, if you don't know this text, it's a, uh, a relatively late uh, uh, Jewish uh, text, um, one of the ones that didn't make it into the Bible, but is a, an ancient Jewish uh, text. Relatively late, but, but still ancient from our perspective. And there are many more stories like this. So in other words, th this is a theme that pops up in Israelite story after story after story, where they repeat this idea of kind of the two brothers, one sacrificed, one released, one sacrificed, one let go, one sacrificed, one expelled, uh, one killed, one saved. Um, uh, one of the examples, that, one of the obvious examples is the Exodus itself where uh, Israel is expelled into the wilderness and saved at the same time through the death of the Egyptian firstborn. So the Egyptian firstborn are killed, the Israelite firstborn and, and people are brought out into the wilderness and saved and expelled into the wilderness. Um, Leviticus 14 is one of the most interesting ones and I, if we had time, I think we should read Leviticus 14. We don't, but go home and read Leviticus 14. It's this really strange ritual where you take two doves, one of them is slain over an earthenware bowl over running water out in the wilderness, and then its blood is put into the bowl, and then the blood, and then the other dove is tied live to a, a wand. They they're really, they're making a wand out of kind of hyssop and, and the several other uh, materials, and then they dip this live bird stick wand thing in the blood, and they sprinkle the blood on the leper. So Leviticus 14 is about cleansing the leper, and you sprinkle this blood on the leper, and then he washes his clothes and does several other things, and you take the other bird and you let it go. And again, uh, this is the idea, uh, this almost reminds me of, of, of uh, if you were to mix it with incense, kind of a smudge wand that, we, that, that you know, modern uh, New Age people try to use you know, to cleanse the, the impurity. Uh, they'll burn this thing and wave it around, and it sucks up the impurity. This, this wand kind of sucks up the impurity, and then the bird takes that impurity with it out into the wilderness, carries it away. Um, but I think it's really hard not to see also this kind of idea that one is killed and the other is free. You see the bird flying free. It's just hard not to see that, that image. I don't think that was intended originally. It was probably the idea that, 
that, that this wand thing soaks up the impurities and then the bird carries the impurities away. So one dies, one is set free. So again, this idea, I think, is that there are two penalties for a ritual, for, for both immoral action, ritual impurity, and sin. And those are death and expulsion. That's what you do to keep Israel clean and pure. You kill people who commit some sins and you expel others from the community. And so we have both these penalties of sin, of death and expulsion represented in these two uh, sacrifices that are made. One is expelled to Azazel, the other is sacrificed to Yahweh. And that um, uh, propitiates the anger of the deity and, and helps you be forgiven. If you were looking for consistency in, in kind of the interpretation of how this works, you're probably uh, disappointed. Uh, again, like I said, when I was younger, I really tried to find that consistency. I was looking for the answer to what this meant. And, and, and barring what it meant you know, to God, what did it mean to the author? And, uh, and then, of course, I, we come to realize there are many authors who wrote over many years. It shouldn't be surprising that they each had a different impression. What we probably have here is a ritual that these people probably performed for generations before they were ever worshipers of Yahweh, before they were monotheists, that they had just, it's a tradition, they've been doing this ritual for years, and then as they became, began to worship a certain way, they modified the ritual to match their, their beliefs, and, and then they modified their beliefs a little to match the ritual, and then they told other stories, like, like Joseph, like the story of Isaac and Ishmael, related to this, myth, this ritual, because the ritual is such a central part of their lives. And each one, each author of each of these stories saw it a little differently. They each saw a different way in which the lamb and, sorry, the, 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 the two goats would carry the impurities away. And they each interpreted it differently so that there is kind of no, no consistency. Some of them see transfer here. Some of them see it acting, the blood acting like a detergent. Some of them see substitution. Uh, so that one is free, the other is, is killed. Others see appeasement of, of both the, the demon in the desert and the, the deity. Um, some of them see an analogy, a reversal, a disposal. There's a lot of ways you can look at this, and every author sort of, of these different stories seems to have come at it from a slightly different perspective, and that's okay. There is no kind of one way to see this. So once we've looked at, at the, um, the traditions around Israel, let's look at other ancient religious traditions that are related. And there are a lot of these. I picked three of them, um, but, but I could have picked a whole bunch. There are a lot. This ritual, and, and rituals of this type, I should say, are incredibly common. They show up all over the ancient Near East. And in that sense, Israel's Day of Atonement ritual is typical of what we would see in the religions around it. In some ways, it's unique. Um, but in a lot of ways, it is the sort of typical thing we might see. I'm going to start with the Akitu festival from Babylon. The Akitu festival was a New Year's festival, just like Rosh Hashanah was a New Year's festival. And along with it came the Day of Atonement. Well, the Akitu festival is this big, long 10 to 12 day festival. Uh, it begins with preparation and mourning. Again, that's the sort of thing that happens right after Rosh Hashanah and then the morning. You see the parallel there. Uh, then they read the creation story on day four. On day five, they cleanse the temple. Well, this is where it has the most similarity to the two goats story. I'll come back to that. Day six, the, they gather the gods from all over the kingdom to rescue Marduk. Uh, Marduk is held captive, so they gather the gods from all around to rescue him. On day seven, Nabu frees Marduk. Uh, verse eight, the gods gather and confer kingship of heaven on Marduk. And then uh, they have a victory parade and a sacred marriage. So this story, Marduk was the, the head god of Babylon. And the Akitu festival is a, 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 a story where they tell, called, well, the Enuma Elish, if, if you remember, <laughs> what was it, like five years ago, um, I had a class on Babylonian religion. The Enuma Elish is their creation story. So you read the creation story, that was day four. Um, but the creation story also has this story where Marduk slays this evil god Tiamat and builds the world out of her, her body, and then because of that becomes king of the gods. So this festival includes both the kingship of Marduk and the kingship and the creation of the kingship of the king of Babylon. Both are, are uh, renewed in this ritual. So cleansing the temple is part of that. Um, and in, in that, um, what they do is uh, they take one 
lamb, I believe, or goat, I can't remember, and they sacrifice it. Just one, not two. But then they take this lamb and they, they rub its body over the temple and it's like a, a bar of soap. It's picking up all the, uh, the impurities of the temple. And then they take that body and they throw it into a river and the river carries it out into the wilderness. So it picks up the impurities and carries it out into the wilderness. So you can see both the sacrifice and the expulsion of the impurity out into the wilderness, but from the, the, the standpoint of one goat. Uh, and then, of course, Marduk is captured, and, and the priest is supposed to slap Marduk. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a ritual involving the actual king that parallels the story of what's happening to Marduk. So the actual king comes and submits to the priest, and the priest is supposed to slap him as hard as he can. And if he slaps him so hard that he draws uh, tears, that was supposed to create uh, an auspicious you know, beginning for the next year. The next year would be good for the people. So he's supposed to slap him as hard as he could. What happens here is that the king is submitting and being humiliated, uh, just as Marduk was humiliated. But then after his humiliation, Marduk was exalted after he was rescued. And so similarly, the king is exalted and then has the sacred marriage at the end that brings fertility to the whole land and his kingship is renewed. So the renewal of kingship to the king involves this uh, humiliation, or this, this passage of humiliation. And this was part of the, the Babylonian equivalent of the Day of Atonement ritual. Uh, and it also cleanses the temple and allows the king to be renewed as, as, a, as the king for the next year. The one that's really interesting to me is the temple at Karnak. Uh, this, what I'm gonna describe here is the ritual the daily temple ritual at Karnak. It's written on this papyrus. Unfortunately, there isn't a good translation of this as far as I can tell. There's one in French. Um, but if you don't read French, which I don't, uh, you're stuck with the Egyptian. Uh, our our um, Middle Egyptian class translated this as our assignment. It took us all year. Uh, we worked on this for a year. This was our, our class assignment. Each, 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 uh, each class period, we'd have to do another pair, a few sentences, right over. And we worked our way through this. And I have all my notes from that, and so uh, I use that as my translation. Um, this is also, at least three chapters of this are actually carved on the wall, and so you get not only the text, the same text, you also get a picture of what, it, what the ritual looked like for three of these chapters. Um, but the rest of it's in this papyrus. Um, and th these are the steps. There's more than 11, but I've just put the first 11. And the part I've picked is the entrance of the priest into the Egyptian Holy of Holies at the Temple of Karnak. And so one of the images I've described for the Day of Atonement is this moment when the priest reverses the fall and enters the Holy of Holies. Once a year, he can enter the veil, pass the veil into the Holy of Holies, and stand before the Ark of God. Uh, so the daily temple of liturgy here is not a, a yearly cleansing. This is something that happened every day. But in e Egyptian tradition, the priest entered the temple every day. And so this is that same moment when the high priest enters the Holy of Holies, which is why I picked it as a parallel. Um, and there are many steps. We'll go through them in, in turn here. Um, so this is the temple, uh, and it, it looks like the Israelite temple. It has a courtyard. This is the equivalent of the Israelite courtyard. It has a holy place. It has two big pillars, just like, you know, Jachin and Boaz. It has a couple different iterations of the two pillars. And then in the back, it has a holy of holies right here. And this temple was added onto, right? So the Holy of Holies was the oldest piece, and then they added onto it, and then they added onto it. But originally, it ended up with a courtyard, a holy place, and a Holy of Holies in the back. And then it has a series of storerooms built around the back that looks exactly like the sort of thing described in the Temple of Solomon in that sense. So the way it begins is you light the torch, and you're going to need a torch because you're going into the back where it's dark and there's no light. Uh, so in the Israelite version, there is a candlestick in the holy place. And then he brings a shovel full of coals and incense to burn into the Holy of Holies. In this case, the priest lights a torch. He bears a censer. A censer is a cup for burning incense. And he places incense on the censer. And then he places uh, incense on the fire. Those, so there's a, there's, a, there's a liturgy, a, a ritual recitation for each of those actions. This would have taken place in this art, large courtyard out in the open air. Um, covered by these kind of uh, goat sphinx uh, things that are the guardians that kind of rim the edge. So he, he, out here he offers the, um, or burns the incense and uh, lights the torch that he's going to need later when it gets dark. 
uh, the incense is, for this case is, is this is much more like the smudge wand, right? The incense's purpose is to purify. And this is a purification ritual. In this case, purifying him. Because if you lived in ancient Egypt, you probably stank. Because you didn't get to wash very much. You sweat. You smell. And especially if you're out offering sacrifices, there's a lot of you know, smells. So incense relieves the, uh, the foul odors with a good odor. And so therefore, it's a, it, you want to smell good if you're going to go into the God's uh, home so that you don't offend the God. Then you traverse to the holy place. There's two recitations for traversing. And in these rituals, they awaken the temple, just like they do for the, um, for the mummy. It's called the opening in the mouth ceremony. They will touch parts of the mummy and, and wake in each part. Oh, and there's another ritual for, um, for the deceased. When he goes to heaven, he has to wake up the ferryman so that he can carry him across the waters. Well, those two rituals are quoted, or, or at least paraphrased, used. They have similar language to what's used here, except here he's waking up the temple. All the pictures on the temple, all the carvings on the temple, it's an it's a, it's a image in stone that represents something else, just like the mummy is an image that represents the person. And you wake up that image because there's some connection between the image of the thing and the thing. The idol itself is an image of the god, and this is the recitation that wakes them up in the sense of um, bringing them to life. He would recite this as, as he traverses this holy place. The holy place was made with uh, reed-like things, like it's like a garden, uh, just like the Israelite holy place. Um, and it, it would have been dark um, with windows from the sides, these, these uh, celestary windows here on the side. This here is a picture looking up into those windows, except the, um, the roof has, has fallen. It's not there anymore, but originally it would have been covered. Um, and so th this would have been a, a dark place with light coming down from the ceiling. But he's got this torch walking through this, this garden-like place in the twilight uh, with these large pillars. If you can kind of imagine what this would have been like, burning incense and holding a torch as he goes. Um, the the um, temple would have been filled with color. Uh, you can see a little of the color. This is my picture, so maybe it doesn't show quite as well. But um, wherever the sun baked these paints, they've taken the paint off. The paint has faded. But if you look up, you can see the remnants of the colors. So if you've ever seen pictures of kind of the um, Egyptian tombs to the dead, the whole temple would have been painted like this as he passed through. So now he's passing through this area and back into the Holy of Holies. When you get to the Holy of Holies in the back, this is what the side of the, that little small shrine looks like. It's got pictures here at the top of the king being washed, anointed, and crowned as a king of Egypt. And then just below that, it has a picture of this boat. It's kind of hard to see, but I'll show you what it looked like later. This boat here is, uh, has poles to be carried. It would have been covered in gold. It has a little cloth covering over the top of it, and it would have had a statue of the deity inside. In other words, this is an ark. Just like the Israelite priest went to the back and found, him, found himself face to face with the ark, this is the Egyptian equivalent of the ark. And it is a boat because it sails across the sky. The sky is made out of water. Heaven is water, etc. So the next piece is once you've gotten to the Holy of Holies, you have a recitation for parting the veil. In, e in Egyptian, the veil is called a yadit. That is the same word used in the Book of the Dead for a net. The gods would cast a net out and try to capture... Uh, no, the, the fish, because they're out fishing. But as you sail across the sky to the heavens, you need to pass the veil, you need to pass the net, and not be caught by it so you um, can actually make it to heaven. You can't be stopped by this net. So again, the passage into the temple is akin to the passage into heaven. And the, the veil and the net are connected. Uh, and of course, the Israelite temple had a veil. Uh, and so this is probably how they're thinking of the veil. It's the yadit, the net. Um, that, that, that bars your way in your entrance to heaven. Then you have a recitation for breaking the seal. Um, this is what that, this is the picture as it's drawn on the, the temple at Karnak. There's a little bolt here, you can barely see it, and he's breaking the seal. Um, this is a picture of what that would have looked like. This is from Tutankhamun's tomb, but the idea is you have these two, uh, two uh, handles to the door and then to make sure no one has gone in when you weren't there, you twine rope around it and you put a mud um, clump on the rope and then you put a seal into the mud uh, stamp. And then when you break that seal, you know that no one else has been in there since you were last there. And so there's, this, there's, a, there's a recitation or liturgy for breaking that seal, then for drawing back the bolt, 
And then for opening, it specifically says it's going to be explicit here instead of just, you know, my reference to Yad, it you know, tells you what's going on. But here they're explicit. You open the doors of heaven. The doors of the Holy of Holies are the doors of heaven. The Egyptian Holy of Holies had two stages, a veil, and then, remember, if you saw the picture, it had kind of two, two parts to it. The first part probably had a veil in front of it. The second part probably had the doors. Well, the doors were made out of wood, and they're gone, so we don't have them anymore. If we try to understand, when I, when I went there and looked around, I tried to understand what's happening. I'm pretty sure the veil probably is on the first bit, and then these doors on the second. This is not from that, but this is a, a small uh, portable shrine, and you can see it's got a bolt that would have been sealed. It's got some doors, and in the back it has this place for the, the god stand. And uh, this, this shape of this kind of half, uh, it looks almost like a modern gravestone, uh, Remember that showed up in, in the Israelite temples uh, that I showed you pictures of, of, um, of one of the high places from Israel. There were two of them, one for Yahweh and one for presumably Asherah in the Israelite high place. Um, and then the statue of the God would have, been stu would have stood in front of this. Um, this is what the inside of the Holy of Holies at Karnak looks like. Uh, this is a picture of the, the Pharaoh, in this case uh, Hatshepsut, um, being washed by uh, two of the gods and made king. Uh, this is God's throne. And so, of course, when you make a king of Egypt, you go into the holy place where, holy of holies, where God's throne is, and you anoint the king as king, and then they, they can sit on their throne, you see. This is what that um, boat would have looked like. This is uh, from Edfu. It's a modern reconstruction of the boat, but the boat has pictures all along the outside. But this is what those kind of Ark of the Covenants, this is the Egyptian equivalent of an Ark. You have pictures of them on the tomb walls that look something like this. These are the cherubim, and they guard the statue, and then it has this cloth over the top of it so you can't see, but in here would be the statue of the deity. The deity was either uh, left standing or sometimes sitting. If it was sitting on a throne, this is what that sort of throne looked like. Again, you see the same sort of thing, cherubim here. They're not cherubim, in this case, they're serpents with a crown, but this is the idea of, the, of what the cherubim were doing as well. They're the protecting deities on either side that form a throne, just like the Ark of the Covenant. It's called the mercy seat, and this is the throne. And so the deity is either standing in, in this sort of configuration or seated on a throne like this. And I want you to cat, put your mind into this ritual. Imagine what it would have been like to start in the courtyard, walk through the, the, the long pillared hall, holding a censer of incense and a torch, passing into the Holy of Holies, reciting these pieces as you, as you break the seal, open, uh, pull back the bolt, open the doors of heaven, and you come face to face with the deity. And we don't have any good Egyptian uh, uh, idols left, especially none of the, the, the large ones at, at the major temples, because they've all been uh, stolen. And, and used for their precious metals, but um, we do have the face mask of Tutankhamun, and this is what they would have, this is the sort of uh, artistry we would have expected um, of these uh, deities. In fact, the point of mummification was to turn the mummy into an idol. And there's a symbol that could take the place of the being, and so the golden mask was to make the mummy look like um, the idols of the temple. So this is what you would see. And I, I, I can imagine sort of the spiritual experience of walking through the temple um, in the darkness, holding a torch and opening the doors and coming face to face with, with this. Um, then the, 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 the priest says, I have not come to take the God from his throne. You can imagine these sort of things were stolen, right? They're, they're valuable. I have not come to take the God from his throne. I've come to secure the God upon his throne. The um, priest falls upon his face, comes, stands up, falls upon his face again. There's repeated kind of bowing and 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 uh, and, uh, and prostration. So you prostrate, you get up, you prostrate yourself again, uh, much like we sort of see in in uh, Muslim ritual today. And then uh, then they wash. They actually take the statue out. They wash it. They put clothes on it. They anoint it with oil. They bring it food. They, um, again, they put special clothes on it, and they, they even put makeup on the statue. And then they put the statue back in the, in the, in the and this, you know, I'm not going to go through all the other steps, right? But this is the, this is the culmination. They put the statue back in the, in the alcove. They close the door, reseal, close the bolt, and reseal it, close the veil, and, and leave. So 
This is the daily ritual. And the idea here is that the priests are house servants for the god. Right? They wash, clothe, anoint, and feed. These are the sorts of things that a house servant would do for his lord. And the priests are doing these things for their god. In fact, there is an Egyptian story that originally mankind lived with the gods. And they were made and created to be house servants for the gods. But the people rebelled. They didn't want to be slaves anymore. And they rebelled against the gods, and so the gods cast them out to earth, and the gods went up to heaven and left people alone in sorrow, misery, in, in, in this world. And so the people made statues of the gods because they could no longer be in the actual presence of the gods. And then they started to wash, clothe, anoint, and feed the statues as they had once done the actual gods themselves, as a form of almost repentance for their transgression of, of rebelling. Now, um, that is one Egyptian interpretation of this sort of ritual. It's not the only one. But that's one of the ways Egyptians made sense of this ritual of washing, clothing, and anointing, and feeding a statue. They know the statue isn't the god, but again, the symbol of the thing can carry the thing's power, and it, it shows the contrition for their disobedience. I believe that particular story has a lot to say about the Exodus story itself, because Israel were slaves in Egypt, and God says, the text is very explicit, uh, let my, God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go from being slaves to you, that they may serve me on this mountain. How? Temple service. And what is the most sacred ritual of that temple service? It's the Day of Atonement where the priest comes in and sprinkles the blood to cleanse this thing of its, of its impurities. Notice the difference. There is no statue. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, the other comparison I want to make is to these Hittite plague texts. These are rituals that the Hittites performed specifically to get rid of plagues, right? to stop plagues that are killing people. It's how you would get, get rid of COVID, right? Um, Instead of so wearing a mask, you, you, uh, you perform this ritual. Uh, if in the land they keep dying, they the people, and if some god of the enemy has caused it, then I perform the following ritual. I drive uh, up one ram, and I take blue wool, red wool, green wool, black wool, and white wool, and I twine it together and make it as a wool crown. Notice this is much like the, um, the, 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 um, the golden you know, piece with the wool that's tied around the, lamp, the, the ram's head in the Day of Atonement um, to, to secure the two Yahweh or two Azazel um, crown piece on its head. So you make this wool crown and you put it on the head of the ram and the ram they drive forth to the road of the enemies. This is, this is the scapegoat, right? And they say the following to him, Whatsoever God of the enemy land has caused this plague, behold, this crowned ram, to you, O God, we have driven out up for peaceful re re relations. As the herd is strong and it is peaceful towards this ram, so may you, whatever God who has caused this plague, be likewise peaceful towards Hati land. Turn faithfully towards Hati land, the crowded ram they drive away into the enemy's land. Um, we get one more I'll read. Um, she wraps a, a little tin on a bowstring and puts it on the right hand and feet of the officers. Notice that the right hand and the right foot, that's that's um, the parts that are anointed and, and touched with the blood in the Israelite ritual. And they say, I have taken away from you the evil, and I have put it on a mouse. Let this mouse take it to the high mountains and to the deep valleys and the distant ways. And then she lets the mouse go, saying, Alawami, drive this mouse forth, and I will give to you uh, a goat to eat. So you see, you take a mouse and, and, and send the impurities out with the mouse, and then you sacrifice a goat, which you give to the god to eat. Um, these two texts are very similar to the Israelite texts, um, but you notice how they interpret the, um, the removal of, of the impurity. In one case, it's appeasement of a god. This god is causing a plague here, so you give it something better. This, god, god, this ram with a crown on its head, you send it out into the wilderness, and the god will hopefully go with it. And you actually send it to the land of your enemies, so the plague will go there, because the god will follow this beautiful ram that you've given it. It's a form of appeasement. Um, and then in, in the mouse version, it's, it's transferal of impurity to the mass. All right. So in the last five minutes, let's do, uh, talk briefly about how Christians saw this ritual in later days. Um, I, I think it's, it's very difficult to, to assume that uh, whoever created this story, 
So if you're a believer and you believe God created this story, or if you believe someone wrote this story and made it up, whoever that was, God or the author, they had the Day of Atonement ritual in mind when they created the, the story of Christ and Pilate. Because what happens here? Just like in the Akitu festival, remember how the king is disgraced and spit upon and then later exalted? That is exactly what happens to Christ. So there's a, there's a story in the ancient world of a king that is humiliated and then exalted. And here we have Christ being humiliated and then exalted. That is tied to the Akitu festival. But in Israel, it would have been tied to the Day of Atonement, where there were two rams. So we have this great story, great Ill, great visual illustration where Pilate stands in front of the Jewish people just like the high priest stands in front of the Jewish people on the day when the high priest would cleanse the Jewish people and he brings forth two goats in this case we have one person named Bar Abbas Bar Abbas means the son of the father the son of God right this is Bar Abbas the son of the father and on the other side we have Jesus Christ the son of God and they both stand before Pilate, who serves like the high priest, and one is chosen to Yahweh. And if you're a, if you're a Trinitarian Christian, it is Yahweh, right? So one is, one is to Yahweh, and it is sacrificed. The other is released, or, or, or uh, you know, cast out. But in this case, released. Both of them, uh, so the story goes, uh, I, should, I should tell you the story if you don't know it. So Pilate stands up and he says, it's tradition that I release one person to you, on this festival, in this case, Passover, right? So it's the Day of Atonement imagery, but it's on Passover. He says, tradition is that I'm going to release one prisoner to you. Do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? And the people say, give us Barabbas. And so the priest, the, the Pilate, releases Barabbas to the people. One is sacrificed, the other is let go. And then the priest, um, wash, uh, the, the Pilate washes his hands. This great image that, again, is also connected to the priest's actions when he washes his clothes, etc. He says, his blood is upon you, and he washes his hands. This is the same idea. Um, in the book of Hebrews, uh, the entire thesis of the book is that we, Christians, have a better high priest. And they will use the word better all the way through. And the idea is, Jesus is the high priest. He's our high priest. And he will serve in the role that the high priest serves, except he serves in the temple of heaven instead of in the earthly temple. He goes before God's throne and sprinkles his own blood before the throne and then, is, and then makes atonement for all the world once instead of every year repeating he does it once for all. So again, there's, there's at least two of these stories of how Christianity interacts with the David Atonement ritual. The first is in, in the construction of the high priest the Barabbas and Jesus story, Jesus' death. And the second is in this book of Hebrews where a large analogy is made, a long analogy through the entire text is made comparing Jesus to uh, the priest's actions on this day, only with his own blood instead of with the blood of the goat. Then we have one of the most fascinating uh, debates to watch. This is where you get out your popcorn and, and kind of kind of watch the fun. Um, but if you if you kind of go online and just kind of look up what is the scapegoat and, and go to these Christian you know blog web pages you know whatever, it's kind of fun to watch how they do this because they can't make up their mind. For about half of them, Jesus, the scapegoat is Jesus. Right? The land that sacrifices obviously Jesus, but so is the scapegoat, right? Because because the scapegoat carries your sins off and Jesus carries your sins off. So this is Jesus. Uh, for the other half of these authors, no, the scapegoat is the devil, right? It's Azazel, it's this demon. And so what's happening is we take our sins and Jesus dies for us so that we can, we can transfer our sins to the devil, right? Um, so, and, and he's cast out. So half of them will describe the scapegoat as Jesus, half of them will describe it as the devil, and half of them will tell the other that they're, they're apostate and going to hell for believing the wrong thing about this. Right? This is really fun to watch. Again, I think this is par for the course. We have a ritual that came from the ancient world where people in the ancient world had multiple interpretations of how it operated, how it worked, and, the Israel, and then it was brought from that to the Israelites who had multiple interpretations of what it is and how it worked. And when that moves into Christianity, there's obvious connections, but they're not quite sure how it works. 
and how to interpret the different pieces. And so they disagree on how to interpret the different pieces. Uh, I believe that these stories have applicability, and so they are often interpreted and reinterpreted and intended to be uh, applicable and interpretable in different ways. There, there doesn't have to be a right answer. Even though interpreting the scapegoat as Jesus and interpreting the scapegoat as the devil are about as opposite of an interpretation as you can make, both of them work because we can see different ways of viewing our own salvation from sin through the death of Jesus or through um, the expulsion of Satan or through Jesus carrying our sins off into the wilderness. It doesn't matter. Either any of those analogies work uh, and you can make them work. Um, now, in conclusion, I think um, the biggest difference between the Israelite and the Egyptian version and, and the Babylonian version of these rituals is that in the Holy of Holies, once you get, get there, there is no idol. Uh, the idol is missing. On the other hand, Jewish interpreters make a big deal out of the line that mankind was made, quote, in God's image and likeness. And so one of the ways you can interpret this is that the idol is still there in the Israelite version. It's just that mankind is the image of God. And so whereas the Egyptians would wash clothes and anoint a statue to, to show God that they were sorry and really wish they could be washing clothing and anointing them, if they hadn't rebelled, they would still be in heaven washing clothing and anointing the gods, being the God's servant. One tradition, and the Israelites will make use of this, is that we don't wash... We don't show our contrition for our fall by washing clothing and anointing a statue. We show our contrition for the fall by washing clothing and anointing each other. One of the rituals associated with this is, of course, the washing clothing, anointing of the priests, the priest washing clothing, anointing each other, offering sacrifice, feeding each other, cleansing each other, making sure that we've removed each other's ritual purity. In other words, this is the way I think Jesus puts this, um, or is, is, is uh, described as having put this, um, when we are judged, the king will answer them. When we go to the Holy of Holies, we stand before the mercy seat and see the actual deity. The king will say, truly I tell you, inasmuch as you did it unto one of these, the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So instead of washing a statue in the Holy of Holies, when we get to the actual Holy of Holies in heaven and stand before the actual king, he won't say, why didn't you wash my statue? He'll say, why didn't you take care of each other? And so this is the, um, what I would say, the, the Christian and Jewish, uh, this is an authentic, also Jewish interpretation of these rituals and of the idea of the image of God, man made in the image of God, the substitute that we take care of while we are away from the actual deity. All right. Uh, that's it for Leviticus 16, uh, the Day of Atonement. And next time we'll finish the book of Leviticus. If you're looking for more information, I recommend the Bible for Normal People podcast. It has an episode, season six, episode 204, Pete Ruins Leviticus, which I re recommended last time. There are also these two uh, commentaries. The first one is the P text, Leviticus 1 through 16, and then 17 through 22 is gonna cover the H text, which we'll do next time. Uh, you can see it's relatively thick book and I think like let me see if I can find the spot here I folded it down yeah, about about uh, here it is about this much of the end of this book is all about the Day of Atonement. In other words, that much of the text, it's a good, you know, maybe uh, eighth of the text, is just about this one chapter. Uh, the Day of Atonement is, is big, complicated. But there's a bunch of material about the Day of Atonement here. I highly recommend this commentary. Um, we also have um, Pritchard's book. This is my copy of Pritchard. Uh, ancient or Eastern texts relating to the Old Testament. He has a whole collection of those kind of Hittite stories we just read. Um, they're in here. So is uh, a whole bunch of uh, Egyptian rituals related to this. Um, the, the Akitu festival has texts that go with it that are in here. Um, so a lot of the stuff we talked about, if you want to read the actual uh, ancient you know, religious texts, this is a good place to go for that. Um, 
And that's it. I will uh, see you next month. Thanks for coming.